So good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to see you coming back today. Um, we have a special guest host standing by um, today with Jennifer Pademski. So we'll we'll go through a little bit of the housekeeping stuff and, and what today is going to look like and have a little bit of a review, I guess, from our last two sessions and um, chat with you just briefly about things that are coming up. So I'm Tanya Capo. I'm from the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation. Um, I'm a lawyer in my day job here out of Winnipeg. Um, I think uh, I started perimenopause about four years ago and it's been really tough. The, the toughest part has been having frozen shoulder for um, a couple of years. And um, the hot flashes, the hot flashes are the worst, the absolute worst. They come and go. They've become part of my new PMS. So the hot flashes go away when I know it's going to be a period time. And that's really, you know, been few and far between now. So I get hot flashes quite a bit um, during the night. At one point, I was getting them hourly, like the drenching sweat kind of night flashes. And interestingly, this is a funny thing. I don't know if this happens to anyone else, but when I get hot flashes, it like releases antihistamines. And if I have a plugged up nose, it just completely clears up. It's, it's the strangest thing, but anywho, that was just um, a little bit of sharing. So um, what we what we want to do is today is have an open conversation. It seems to be that there's this really deep need for people to talk about their experiences and just have someone listen who understands it um, because you're going through the same thing or maybe you have questions about issues around it. We started this series trying to put a foundation down on what the Indigenous centered experience on menopause looks like or feels like. And it was important for us to do that um, from a place with the elders, some grandmothers, uh, my mom was one of them, and Maria Campbell. And we wanted to talk about our language and, and what is the word in our language for menopause to kind of get back to <clears throat> what were our teachings around menopause and you know we we'd asked those of you who were listening at that time to go back and find out from your language speakers what does menopause how do you say it in your language and what does it translate to because we know it doesn't literally translate into the word menopause it means something else so those are just some things to help get the conversations going and try to bring back some of the teachings we might have had around menopause what are some medicines that might be available to us in our own backyards that we can use to help ease some of the discomforts that come with it. So I'll turn it over to Christy and then we'll continue on. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Uh, I'm really grateful that uh, Jennifer Podemski is here to uh, take over the host seat uh, for us today and in our community discussion. As I was saying, this is our third episode in in a number that we're not sure of. We're just gonna keep on going deeper and deeper into this subject uh, wherever our curiosity leads us. Um, this series started uh, by Tanya and I having discussions with each other about, about what our symptoms were and and the the sort of profound statement Tanya made, which which was that this potentially this stage of life could potentially be half of our life and yet nobody talks about it and there's things that we wish that we knew um, as younger people uh, th that that you know could have really helped out right now <laughs> right about now so tanya shared some of her uh, some of her uh, symptoms and things that she's going through and i thought that i would share some of mine since that's sort of the subject that we're doing with this community discussion is we're going to open it up and and welcome um, our attendees to say a few few words. We're going to limit our. Um, uh, we're going to ask you if you want to share to limit what you have to say to two minutes, and uh, that's just so that we can create enough space for everybody to come in, and and be able to say what they want to say. Uh, it's it's a little bit different hosting a webinar. We're not quite sure. We, we have our our friend Nicole handling the admin, and Tanya and I are going to sort of bumble our way through it, I suppose. So some of the symptoms that I experienced um, were heart palpitations and muscle stiffness, joint stiffness, 
um, in such a way that it worried me greatly. I thought I was developing uh, maybe a heart condition that I thought that I was, um, I thought that I was maybe developing arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I didn't really have, and I still don't have very many hot flashes. I'm fully in menopause now. But one thing that I found very uh, interesting is that even while I was trying to seek health care, uh, to once I got to the point of thinking something really is happening here and it's not normal and I need to find out what's happening in case there's complications or in case there's something serious happening. Um, and when I tried to seek health care, not one doctor or one healthcare professional ever asked me if I was in menopause and they still haven't. So it leaves you feeling like you're, you might be dying right away, that you're crazy, that you've developed something terrible. Um, and the things that I wish I knew uh, early on that, I, that I'm just finding out now is the, is the great risk to have osteoporosis or develop a heart condition or, um, or there's other things that I wish that I had have known. It's so much more than just hot flashes and people experience it um, at different ages. We have early onset, uh, people that have early onset menopause. We have people that have uh, menopause through uh, medical emergencies or surgical, um, surgically induced menopause. Uh, we have, uh, you know, people in our community that, that have challenges around accessing healthcare. And, and so there's these things that, I, that I'm thinking about a lot when it comes to these series and the impacts of not having this be a subject that is open and understood and where we can find the kind of care and support that we need for the, the, these very strange and unique symptoms that we're all experiencing. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Tanya and we'll get on with the show as they say. <laughs> Thank you. So <clears throat> on Instagram, you know, on social media is usually um, a good place to to find out information and you can hear from everyone about different things. And I, I follow Jennifer Pademski on Instagram. And as Christy and I started having this conversation with each other about menopause in general, um, I noticed that Jen was also having this conversation about menopause on her Instagram. So I would read them and I would be really impressed with the, the vulnerability of sharing because it's really, menopause does something to your self-esteem that just kicks its butt to the curb and back. And so for someone to be able to, you know, be that vulnerable and, and share those kinds of experiences and feelings and, and physical happenings, I thought, I thought was really great. And so when Christy and I decided we we're going to have these conversations and we're talking about, okay, what, what should we talk about and who should we ask to come? I said, I want to ask Jen to come because I, I want her to be able to share about what made her go to Instagram and start sharing these experiences. And then second to that, I thought she would be a great host to have a conversation, our first conversation with participants on the subject. So I, I reached out to her and she was more than happy and I'm so thrilled. So, so thank you very much, Jen, for, for agreeing to be a part of this. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself and then we'll get into the discussion. Wow, amazing. This is so exciting. Thank you, Tanya and Christy. I am so excited to be here because I love talking about perimenopause and menopause. It's literally the main conversation that I have with women today. And I could be at an executive board meeting and it will come up. I could be on the train and it'll come up. It just seems like no matter where I am, I'll open the door just a little crack and the floodgates open and it doesn't matter who I'm talking to. Um, but first, let me just say, my name is Jennifer Pademski. I am coming to you from Barrie, Ontario. Uh, I come from, well, my mother comes from Muscopeding First Nation in Saskatchewan and I was born and raised in Toronto. So, 
you know, my experience with uh, traditional knowledge and even language and being a part of my community is super urban and somewhat disconnected because my mother, you know, it was so far from her family. And now I know how to reflect on, you know, the impact of, of intergenerational trauma and residential school and what that did to our family and how I ended up in Toronto disconnected from culture. So even in this conversation, you know, when you talk about menopause from a perspective through the language lens also is something that I, I didn't actually, I don't have, I didn't have that in my consciousness to even think about that. And now I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask my family at home what that is, because I often wonder like what, if we, if, if our matriarchal wisdom, you know, is this idea of rematriation and we're, we're so, so connected to this, uh, this wisdom that of the ages from ancestors, from the beginning, what were, they must have had something in place for this. And I'm so interested to know what that is. And in my work, be able to bring that forward because it is, I think the key to unlocking the full potential of rematriation in, in the all of the spaces and sectors that we work within, the key is to understand this part of a woman's life. Because just when you get your shit together, you know, you like work your ass off your whole life to like fulfill this dream of whatever we think it is through a, you know, very patriarchal lens of like, oh, I'm going to have a family and I'm going to have a career and all of these things. And for me, my perimenopause started at 40. So it was like, just when I started to have my shit together, everything fell apart. So I really believe that the strength lies in the wisdom of our matriarchs and that it, at that indigenous knowledge to be able to like help each other to make it through this phase like even better than the first 40 years i believe that that's possible um and and thank you for saying that about instagram but i really just i couldn't I couldn't just sit back and assume that nobody wanted to talk about this because I literally opened this conversation with, um, with everybody. And the conversation just is so remarkable. And I always walk away thinking like, wow, we just talked about the craziest things about our bodies and our, about our menstrual menstrual cycle. I usually open it with a really good one because for me, the, the one of the worst things that was happening aside from pain and discomfort there there were terrible things for me that i was experiencing but it was the explosive periods and i don't know if anyone else has that but i was a person who had like kind kind of periods my whole life it was like yeah i had a period for 3 days that was fine and whatever and then when my perimenopause started um i would be sitting at a in a meeting and I would stand up and be soaked in blood. And that has happened maybe 15 times. And on the, in the worst places, like the airplane or like, you know, meetings or when I'm in Toronto and I live in Barrie and I have to get back by the train and I've thrown out many pants, many jeans. <laughs> it's like, I know now to wear long coats. <laughs> like there's just, it's just one of those things. Anyways, the, those kinds of experiences made me think I should, I should raise this and see who else wants to talk about it. I want to talk about it more. So I'm so happy that you're, you're doing this because like, I couldn't have been more excited to see it on Instagram and be like, oh my gosh, there's finally something for us to have this conversation. Um, and I do, I do feel like, you know, there is very, there are very few places to go for help. Like you said, Christy, the medical system, like you can, I went to go get a hernia operation and the male doctor said to me, you know, and I know I've gained a lot of weight. I've probably gained 40 pounds since, since I turned 40 and I'm almost at the weight of my first child now. So like just coming to terms 
that the weight gain is hard enough and coming to terms with the fact that I can't even lose it is hard enough. I go into this, the place to get my surgery, to get my assessment, because I have two hernias. And he's like, you're 35 pounds overweight. Well, you need to lose 35 pounds before we can even get in there. And I was like, what the hell? Like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm, I, I'm in perimenopause. I'm not going to lose 35 pounds. Do you understand what you're talking about? So now I'm just supposed to live with these two hernias and not be able to get operated on. So it's, it's things like that, that really, uh, you know, make this road challenging and the list goes on. And I'm sure once we open up for, for open this up to the, the audience, um, or the participants, we'll hear lots of different stories about things we're facing. But truthfully, knowing that there's just a place where you can talk about it, it, it feels so much better. What are what are so some? I, of the I'm things? really grateful. Well, sorry, what I have these delays on these zooms are not like a conversation. What are some of the uh, things that you wished that you? What are what are a few things you wished you knew as a younger person? I you know there's so many. I have a 13 year old daughter, so it is so just it's like so poetic it's so poetic that she just got her period and i'm just going through this so this is a perfect time to tell her everything i wish i was told those things are everything from uh you know what you're experiencing now you know i know it hurts and i know you feel like a different person once a month and i know you feel like ugly and i know you feel not yourself really work with that. Like find a way to work with that because one day you're going to come of a certain age and the feeling that you have right now is going to be like a thousand times that. (laughs) So get to know it, get comfortable with it, figure out how to work with it. And so that it doesn't fully derail you and your life. So that you have to basically, you know, feel like you're going through puberty again, you know, wishing that your body would, would cooperate with you. I think it's, it's more in the way that we have to cooperate with our body. You know, I just wish I would have known that this was even a thing. There's a lot of things I wish I would have known. Um, I think a lot of it just, it has to do with, un, you know, women, I'm in the film industry too. So it's just a terrible industry for self-esteem and, you know, body image and that sort of thing. So overall, if I could go back and tell myself anything, and if I ever would have listened, like, like, as if we would have listened anyway, <laughs> it, would have <laughs> um, it would have been you know, to really learn to work in harmony and live in harmony with my body. Hmm. I finally got to a place where, you know, I felt like I could, I could really be with my body and love her. And then she turned on me. (laughs) And I think if I was, you know, if I had more practice on how to how to be in concert with my body in my younger years and not like succumb to the pressures of society and like, you know, eating disorders and body shaming my own self, my own body, and just being not nice to my body. Um, I think those, that those behaviors come from a really patriarchal construct. So if there's anything I could offer my, my daughter, it would be to help expand that matriarchal perspective and to support her in working with her body so that she has the tools when she turns whatever, hopefully not 40, but like maybe 45, uh, she has the tools to be prepared to be like, oh, this is what she was talking about. Now I'm just gonna like take a step back and not be so hard on myself. Yeah, I mean, if if I would have known what was happening, like like Christy, I found myself at 
hospitals and doctors and like no one it's like you're just like hello you really can't tell me what's going on here <laughs> i wonder if you also have some thoughts about um how you how your husband has been responding or learning going through this with you and and how you know we, we we're trying to really also emphasize the need for our our men and boys to to be educated about this and and what role can they play in, in supporting us and and help get away the patriarchal influences you know that still oppress us when it comes to our bodies and so can you speak a little bit to that yeah, uh, I guess, to be honest, at the beginning, uh, you know, there's the physical parts of it, which I think are are easier to to explain to someone and to ask for support with, but it's the more unexplainable, like mental health stuff that I really had a hard time explaining, right? I could not, ex I could not explain why I would have these that I would fall into deep rage and hate, like out of nowhere. And then I started, you know, going down the rabbit hole of how that all is impacted by menopause and perimenopause. And, you know, that I, it took me a while to realize, oh, I don't hate him and want him to move out tomorrow. <laughs> I just, I just am having a moment that I didn't really know what was happening that was, you know, several years ago, I'm going to be 50 in like two months. And uh, so that was close to the beginning, maybe when I was 42. And then, you know, and then we got stuck in COVID. And I was just like, Oh, my gosh, I don't know if we're going to survive this. <laughs> and, you know, actually, when I was finally able to articulate what was happening to me, when I had a vocabulary for it, he became he really like turned around and understood. Um, what was going on, you know, not understood. I mean, he empathizes with it and understands that it's not, uh, that it's not easy, but there, he is very, very supportive, although he will just never understand, you know, he will just never understand. And neither will my son, um, who's 11, but I do also with him, you know, it's more so like for the women in your life, when, when you are an adult and whoever it is, if you're married to a woman or have a friend as a woman, whatever it is, your sister, just know this, like, you know, there are things that have nothing to do with you that will happen to a woman's body and it will impact you in some way. Don't take it personally <laughs> and do your best to be supportive. But then there's other, like other things that I think were very annoying for my husband. And this is, I'm sure every single person here can relate to it. Like at the beginning of my perimenopause, I, I had, um, during ovulation, super smell. And I don't know if either of you had super smell where you could, I could smell, like I could smell things that I didn't even know that smell existed. <laughs> <laughs> I do not even know how I became a super smeller, but we were living in a house and uh, every, every few weeks, I was like, I smell mold. Like I, I smell mold. The, this house is full of mold. We have to move. This is going to kill us. This is a moldy <laughs> house. And then it would go away. This happened for a few months. And then the, on the fourth month, I was like, I'm getting some testers in here. So I think I paid like a ridiculous amount of money to see if there was a mold, something in our house. So the guy came in and there was nothing. It was zero. There was like, he's like, this is like the most zero you can get of mold. <laughs> There's not even a little bit. <laughs> he said, I hope you don't mind me asking you this, but have you started perimenopause? <laughs> have you started perimenopause? And I was like, uh, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I guess, I guess it's possible. I have, he's like, because my wife, when she started perimenopause, she started smelling the craziest things that she could never smell before. And then I went down <laughs> super smells uh, in menopause and perimenopause. And sure enough, it's a thing. So that was me. And I don't have that anymore. Thank goodness. Uh, okay. So there, there were other things like, yeah, sorry, me, go ahead. Let me get this straight. So uh, 
half the population who experiences menopause cannot get a doctor or a nurse to ask them that if they are in menopause, but you can get your mold <laughs> tester guy to ask you if you're in menopause. That's the state of menopause in queer in that you're in. That's yes. hilarious. That's exactly it. That's so funny. Okay, well I think <laughs> This is just really funny. Um, so I think that we uh, we do have some questions. So it, this is set up as a webinar format, which means that we you don't see the other participants. We don't see the other participants either. We can see who is a participant and then the names. Um, we don't have the ability to invite people on screen, but we have the ability to invite people to turn their audio on their microphone and be able to share their story that way. Um, and so that's what that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to Tanya and I will turn our cameras off. We'll be in the background monitoring the Q and A. If you have a question and you don't necessarily want to, um, you know, a question for Jennifer or, or just a comment, uh, you can put it in the Q and A. Um, and if you would like to come on your audio to share your story, share your uh, your perspective or something that you wish that you had have known as a as a person before you entered uh, perimenopause or menopause. And for clarity's sake, menopause is uh, medically defined as one year without your menstruation. Perimenopause is the years in before that time and and postmenopause is after that time but generally menopause itself is used to describe the whole spectrum of of what that what that what happens there um uh, we are obviously you know artists lawyer artists we're obviously not um not um experts in the medical field we'll be having dr janet smiley on april 19th and 20th to be able to talk about some of the medical details uh, from a, from an expert perspective, but we're happy to share what we know. We're going to ask people to, like I said, limit your uh, conversation, your story, your questions to about two minutes, so that we can open it up for as many people as possible. Um, and so, uh, is there anybody? Please put it in the Q and A if you want to uh, be on screen. <coughs> Um, to or not on screen, but on the audio, if you want to share your your story. Um, right now, we don't have anybody who is volunteering, so we're just going to keep on talking. There, there's one here. Oh, is there's there? one here oh, on sure. the Q and A. Yes, I see. Do any of y'all use any traditional knowledge or medicines for early perimenopause um, symptoms? I definitely have something to uh, to answer that with, but I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Oh, yes, I see that's Emily Rackpe. Hi, Emily. I know Emily. So, um, so you will answer that, Jen, and Tanya and I will go off screen. And then I see Tanya, okay. Tanya and I see that there's a, a number of people who are wanting to come on and and share. So we're going to go down the line. And like I said, we really do. We are going to have a lot of people wanting to share. So we we will uh, remind people when it gets to be the two minute. Uh, if you go over, we're going to ask you kindly and respectfully to that we might have to um, to end end it uh, and and move on to another person just to try and get everyone's voice heard. And I really hate being. Oh, that I hate doing that, but yeah, and, and just good. also to add that this is our first time trying, <laughs> so we're definitely going to do it again. So, our apologies in advance if we do something crazy, in inadvertently we were not trying to be offensive, but we're learning from this as we go. So just ask for your patience, and definitely we'll be doing this again at another time. So, okay, we'll start with Emily's question and answer, and then we'll start bringing people on. So one thing that I really swear by is uh, sage tea. Um, I was given this information or this knowledge uh, early on, and I really believe that it's been a big part of my uh, wellness process with uh, symptoms, uh, especially, you know, hot flashes and also just generally mood and digestive stuff, like an all around sort of um medicine. Um, I do, I would love to know if there are, if there is a woman, uh, who is, you know, sharing this knowledge 
I would love to go and see her because I don't have access to this knowledge otherwise. <laughs> okay. So next, we're going to get uh, Jamie Morse audio going. Hang on for a sec as we figure this out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jamie, I think you can talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. I, this is so timely. I had um, some x-rays done for the second time um, uh, recently. And ever since my now four and a half year old has been born, I've been going to the doctor over and over about pelvis issues, pelvis issues, pelvis issues, and hernia, same as uh, you, Jennifer. And they kept telling me, oh, it's it's from birth. And I told them, no, I've had babies before. Like I, it's years after and I'm still, so it, it's been a, a lot of like, um, not believing in my pain. And then I uh, got the x-rays back and now it's like, it's osteoarthritis. And I, it, and now I have bone spurs and now I'm missing cartilage between my hip joints. And so I, I wish people would have taken me seriously earlier. And, and I think that um, there's something also about healthcare and, and just like indigenous women and like how much pain we're supposed to endure because uh, I've seen it throughout my, um, my care. And uh, I don't know, that's something that maybe Janet Smiley will touch on, but I just wanted to share and say thank you for your posts. And I hope and wish that there's a way that we can share this all, all together. Um, We'll have more conversations around it. That's it. I just wanted to talk. <laughs> Thanks. I agree. I agree. Thanks, Jamie. And yes, I'm so sorry to hear all of that. That is, it's that that makes me so angry. <laughs> uh, it, generally, I think that it's very hard to manage anger during this time uh, because it is there's a lot of gaslighting from the system in general. Um, so yes, I, I understand. I do, I do want to say one thing though, um, because I was having some pretty severe issues in the pelvis. Oh, that's a whole other thing. We should have one that's just talking about the pelvis guys. We should do this another time because I did, I have learned a lot about, uh, inflammation in the gut and how it impacts the pelvis and the pelvic floor and Kegels and, you know, the, the wellness around the pelvis and how much we should be focusing on that to address inflammation. Um, and especially the hormonal overload that we're experiencing in the gut. And for me, this is maybe same, the same as you, Jamie, that my gut would get so inflamed that it would knock out a nerve in my leg. And then I would have to go get adjusted my pelvis adjusted. So it's all interconnected. And I think the more, you know, we talk and the more conversations we have, the closer we'll get to having to, to having spaces where we can inform people before it's too late kind of thing. Thanks for that. Um, we have, um, Marie Marion is up next. I just have to figure out how to, okay, allow to talk. So uh, Marie, you should be able to speak now. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, my experience has been, uh, I had a, a partial hysterectomy due to just incredibly painful periods and bulky, just the it was so different but it was the pain and so when they finally did the um the hysterectomy um I was really lucky because I had it removed uh vaginally so um my recovery was actually so much easier than if they had had to cut me um but that being said it was so I had uh they didn't know at the time but I had tumors and they said there was so many of them that they almost couldn't get it out my uterus. Um, but since then, and the doctor did tell me that uh, because they had taken out my uterus and my, um, oh, I don't know what the word is it in, in English, sorry. Um, I still have my ovaries, everything else is gone. Uh, that I would be, I, I might experience some symptoms of menopause, but then I would go back to where I was in my like my home hormonally eventually 
And I, do, I will say, like, I had some moments of, I don't want to call them hot flashes. I had a few, like, warm flashes. Like, oh, maybe I'll just take off my sweater kind of thing. And, um, and so then afterwards, my hormones went back to uh, not being in menopause or perimenopause, even though I wasn't having a, a period. Um, I did have a female doctor at one point tell me that I was in menopause because she couldn't explain my symptoms any other way, even though I'd been in a car accident. She was wrong after the blood work came back. Uh, I wasn't in menopause, wasn't in perimenopause. Um, since then, I have gone into menopause. That was maybe 10 years ago. But I, I besides the warm flashes, I, I, I get like little hairs really like almost uh, bristly on my face and kind of like where you would get a mustache and a beard. It's really weird. Just little random ones here and there. But I get this really long hair on my forehead that grows and it's really fine. And, um, and even like those little, those hard hairs on my inner wrists. I don't know where that comes from. But it's just a bizarre, like, what's my body doing now? Like, it's interesting. Um, a lot of joint and muscle stiffness. Um, I did have frozen shoulder for a long time. Um, but other than that, like, I had some heart palpitations. But I find that uh, doctors don't really talk about it. And I'm so glad that women are. I was shopping for furniture the other day and happened to have a, a woman helping me. And she's like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm having a hot flash. And I'm like, don't apologize to me. She's like, nobody talks about it. I'm like, I'll talk to my, talk to you about it. You know? And it was just this moment of com camaraderie where it was so nice to be able to speak openly to another woman about something that nobody talks about and mm -hmm. half the population. Goes through. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Marie. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Tanya is going to be uh, bringing on our next uh, guest. Yeah. Zoe, are you there? I am going to um, uh, unmute you here. Okay, did you did you still want to speak, uh, Zoe? Yeah, can you hear me? Zoe. Yes. Hi, Jen. Hi. Um, I had the opportunity of working with Jen this year on a show that's coming out this spring. Little bird, I'm so excited. Um, so it's nice to see your face again, Jen. But I wanted to share um, a couple of things that were that are game changers for me. And um, I would love to hear more people's game changers as I'm, you know, moving through some of these weird and wild and wacky symptoms. Um, but one thing that's really saved my life are NYX underwear, K-N-I-X. Um, I no longer have to change the entire bed and I can leave the house on the first day of my period where normally I'd have to be housebound and like change my pants and clothes all day and like sit on a towel and stuff like that. And I'm just like, am I hemorrhaging? Am I dying? <laughs> Is womanhood trying to kill me? Um, because sometimes it feels like it, <laughs> um, but Nick's underwear changed my life. Um, I'm no longer a period shut in. And, um, the other thing when I started having like what felt like weird PMS, like emotion, the big emotional shift that I wasn't used to in PMS, like I'm used to sort of, I was used to sort of like crying and not knowing why I was crying and then figuring out, oh, I have PMS, you know, every month, it's like I'm a new, I'm in, <laughs> it's like it was my first time or something, you know, and then, but then this whole newness of emotional ups and downs, like came around and I was like, what is going on? And sleeplessness and headaches, um, bad, weird in the back of my head headaches and not being able to sleep. And I was such a great sleeper my whole life until this time. And I started taking, I, I was like, there must be something I can take some sort of supplement. And I just looked at the grocery store. I live on reserve and the, the town close to me is Brantford. It's not like the kind of place where you can go to, you know, some fancy herbal store or whatever, but just at the grocery store, 
um, was this thing called Harmony Menopause. And it's just an herbal supplement. There's a lot of um, like chaste tree and different like Chinese uh, yam. And I don't know, I can, can't list all the ingredients, but that really, really helped me. I can sleep, my moods are better. Um, I'm not crying for nothing. I um, don't have headaches. My, I, it, this all was happening to me while I was working on that show, Jen, and I just was remember feeling like I've never been uglier in my whole life than I have been since I was working on that show. But I realized much later, oh, it was hormones and I just, the sleep quality was so poor. Um, so that those two things have really, really helped. And I asked my stepmother, um, if what about traditional medicines and she said, um, a woman from here told her about a medicine called dirty root and she hasn't been able to find out like other names for it. Um, like what the, maybe the plant name, like white people's name for it is. Um, so we can't, uh, she doesn't yet know like where to find it or what it looks like or what it is. Cause that was like an old, old lady's name for, for this medicine. So I'm super curious to find out what that is called. So we're still looking for that. So if anybody knows what dirty root is, I would love to know. Um, and that's traditionally what people would use here. Mm-hmm. And you are, you are in six nations. I'm in six nations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I'm so interested also in about it, the traditional knowledge around transitioning. You know, we, we, I'm lucky to come from a culture where I had a coming of age ceremony, um, on my mom's side, I'm from Bella Bella. So I had a Hertzog coming of age ceremony when it came my time to transition to, uh, menstrual cycles. And I'm just, we don't really hear about that kind of ceremonial stuff happening for our trans- transition now, you know? And I'm like, did we just die <laughs> before this happened back in the day? Is it lost to colonialism? I'm just so interested in that part of it because um, somebody framed this transition for me in one time where they're like, no, this is a sacred time. And I was like, it is? Cause I feel horrible. <laughs> I don't feel sacred, you know, but maybe if there was a way for me to, you know, embrace that, then I could, you know, get more on top of feeling better about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Let's, let's figure that out. Let's find, find one or create one. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thanks Zoe. Um, our, we have a question from our, um, our attendees, Jade Harper. She asks, Jen, did you experience a lot of sadness when you were experiencing perimenopause? Well, I'm still in perimenopause and yeah, I think just like Zoe was saying, it's like this, I think it's not maybe as much, it's not as bad these days as it was at the beginning but the, the emotional load, I I don't know if it's sadness, really. It's more of a darkness. I think that's something that I find when I talk to other people about it, that's something that they also feel. It's not like you can't really put a name to it. Um, Although I don't really feel that way anymore. It was very, very bad in the first, like, I'd say four years between 40 and 44. It was pretty rough. But also I do read a lot about menopause, perimenopause. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are, you know, not uh, necessarily as relatable as this. Um, and yeah, the emotional, the emotional stuff is really significant. And like Zoe was saying, just, you know, crying out of nowhere and, you know, very similar to PMS, but a thousand times worse and more intense and more, more kind of derailing. Cause that's not really supposed to be happening to us at a time in our life when, you know, we've, we've already gone through all that stuff. So mm-hmm. I guess an answer to your question, be, be prepared for that, but also, you know, be prepared in a way that you're, you're able to move through it. That helps. Thank you. Um, so our next uh, caller, I'll call, I'll say, is Rissell. Uh, Rissell, maybe introduce yourself. Where are you calling from and, and what nation are you from? So Lake Waita, it's Rissell here. I'm calling with my awesome post-COVID voice, unfortunately. I'm calling in from Ashwet I'm delighted to 
um, be part of both the Shwetmuk and the Statlian people in what's now known as British Columbia. Uh, it's a beautiful day here, and I'm really so thankful for this conversation. Christy, I brought this up to you and to Tanya, but I wanted to say this very openly in this setting for everybody to hear. Um, and I really thank for the comment that Jennifer just made about how we need to dig in and maybe we need to create some of our own ceremonies. Because, for example, in my family, I have literally no one to turn to about perimenopause or menopause because everybody has had my mother, aunties, whomever has had some form of hysterectomy. Whether it was early on or otherwise. So nobody knows. Um, so a lot of the guiding principles, my mother also, um, because certain things weren't talked about. Now I'm um, a couple years ahead of you there, Jennifer. So my mom's of a boomer generation. Um, so we understand different generations. People will and won't talk about. There's also a lot of shame that comes from residential school that we have to really acknowledge. And it's not that our mothers or our aunties are failing us. There was systemic reasons why things were all that disruption that happened. So I think in all of this discussion, we talked about that feeling of sadness. I think part of the feeling of sadness is that disconnect that the last person had that ability to have a coming of age ceremony. I am so thankful for that. Um, I just went through one last year because it wasn't available to me until last year. And I learned so that I can assist to bring the coming of age ceremony back into our territory. So I just really wanted to put that out there um, and really open up any ideas, whether it's you, Christy, or Tanya, or Jennifer, or whomever, about how can we integrate and reshape when there's disruption gaps in the way that we have around perimenopause, menopause. And I raise my hands to the three of you for your vision, uh, for your willingness to put these um, conversations forward. The last tiny thing I'm going to squeeze in there, I know I'm over time, but um, I don't want to go into my own medical history. I don't feel comfortable in sharing that. But there are some chronic conditions that come along with perimenopause and menopause, some things that can lead to much worse things. And I'm not saying that to scare you, but if you got something going on with your indoor plumbing, get it checked out, advocate for yourself. Because like we heard from another person, um, a couple of questions prior, it matters. And there. Um, uh, I don't want anybody else to have the issues, you know, that we've gone through because out of ignorance. Cook Stretchum, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I, I definitely agree with <clears throat> that last part. And I did see it in the comments about, um, you know, things that mask other things and we might mistake uh one symptom for something else and absolutely advocating for yourself and especially you know, in a system that in many ways disregards Indigenous women in particular, it's very hard to advocate for yourself, uh, but it's so important. And if you need to find support to to get the tests you need and get the ultrasounds you need or just to, to get the blood work you need, whatever it is, um, do your best to make it happen because there are certain things that could be going on that may appear as something else but are actually more serious. Um, sorry. Okay, so next up we have Angel Docs Data. Are you there, Angel? Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. So I think I think one thing, my story very quickly is I got very, very sick when I was 39 years old. And the doctors had no idea what was wrong with me. Um, I went through a lot of medical racism. Um, I was shoved, uh, antidepressants were shoved down my throat. I was having relentless panic attacks. Um, I got agoraphobic. I was sore. I was stiff. I was nauseous. I had vertigo. Prior to that, nothing was wrong with me. It's like I literally woke up one day and just felt like I got hit by a truck. Um, six years later, so I went through this for six years with no answers, working from home, trying to figure out how to make money. I had just graduated university. I was just kind of like, okay, what do I have to do? Like, I can't hardly move around, but I got to do something, right? I got to feed my kids. So 
Um, I switched doctors finally. And she looked over blood work from last January. And she says, you're postmenopause. You're postmenopausal. And I said, post? And she said, yeah. And I said, uh, I'm 44. Like, how, how am I post? She's like, I don't know. Like, we have to, we'll try to figure it out. So one thing I found out on my journey is that a lot of First Nations women who've lived in First Nations communities have to understand that there's environmental trauma. So when I say that, First Nations communities have been the subject of environmental racism for years, years, decades, centuries, right? All of our communities are built by dumps, uh, contaminated water sources, you know, we're a haven to dump dirty soil from off reserve. There's no federal regulations on it. You know, the fish have more rights than we do, you know? So what I found out is there was a nice toxic dump down the road for me. And I have dioxins and furons all through my soil, all through my groundwater. And when I started to research it, Dioxins and furons cause hormonal imbalances. They cause endocrine disruption. They cause everything I was going through. And of course, there's no cleanup. There's no cleanup down here. We've turned to Environmental Canada. Everybody we could think of, Patty Haju, everybody. And they're all just kind of like, well, you know, that sucks, but, you know, well, we don't know what to do. There's no laws there. We can't do anything, right? But... <laughs> the things that I learned on my journey was that a, like the previous lady said, check your water, check your water, get it tested. It cost me $4,000 to get my groundwater tested around my house. I had to pay that out of pocket. Only then did the environmental health, indigenous health, environmental, whatever his title is actually start to pay attention. Find out there's cancer clusters down my road. Um, my daughter was one of the ones. She was 22 years old. She had thyroid cancer. My mother's riddled with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. My father had colon cancer, and we all live on the same property. So when I start looking into this, I'm like, I wonder how many other women are suffering in my community from early onset menopause, because this contamination I'm finding after my research is all through my community. It's all over the place. There's, there's pockets of um, contamination all splattered throughout this community, right? But one person that I did get a lot of help from through my journey with menopause was a naturopath. The naturopath um, explained to me a lot of things that was going on. You know, I didn't start feeling better till probably about two months ago after six years of chronic anxiety, chronic panic, you know, chronic dizziness, chronic nausea, achy, you know, intrusive thoughts that comes along with, with this itchy skin, rashes, phantom smells, migraines, you know, everything just goes berserk, right? Because your hormones actually help control like antihistamine in your system. So my purse consisted of gravel, ginger gravels, Pepto-Bismols, Tums, Benadryls, Claritins, those were all in my purse because not only when you're in menopause do you feel like crap, you also develop a whole concoction of food sensitivities. So you'll go to a restaurant and say, oh, I love Indian food. I've always loved it. Next thing you're sitting there and it's like, why are my, why are my lips numb? Why am I itchy? Okay, you know, <clears throat> but I think like as Indigenous women, it's, it's extra hard for us because we're already stigmatized by the healthcare system. I was labeled so often as a drug seeker. It was, I'd be like, I would literally go into an emergency room with heart palpitations, you know, panic attacks, because I've never had them before, right? I had zero history of that until I got sick. And one doctor actually said to me, well, we don't give pain pills. And I said, well, that's good. Cause I never asked for one. You know, I'm, I'm wondering why my heart's racing. The first thing they used to do on me all the time was blood work. 
And I'm just fortunate enough that two of my friends are doctors and they were saying they're checking for, for drugs in your system with the heart palpitations. Mm -hmm. That's what they're looking for first and foremost. And I'm like, okay, not once did any of my practitioners that I seen decide to check my hormones because I was so young, it was apparently impossible you know, there's no way you can be in menopause. No way. You know, like you're only 38, 39 years old. And I'm like, well, my menstrual cycles are messed up. I'm getting two a month, sometimes none a month. Sometimes they're extremely heavy. Sometimes they're not, you know, and I talked about the phantom smells. I keep smelling things. I, it smells like something's burning in my house. Like I've even called my father over here and said, can you help me look for this? I think the kids have something plugged in. And he'd help me look around and he's like, I can't smell anything. And then it would just go away. Or I, it would smell like I was standing behind a diesel truck. Like the exhaust smell would come. And I'm like, oh my God, like what is wrong with me, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like along with the menopause stuff, like what really helped me with the anxiety was a medication called L-theanine. And you can get it at a health food store um, and it helps with the nervous system. Um, that helps a lot with just taking that edge off of everything, right? Like, and the sage tea, yeah, that does help with hot flashes. Um, my mother's friend is a medicine woman and she was making me medicine. Uh, she, I didn't know what was in it. It just basically came in this big brown paper bag. And she's like, here, boil it with five liters of water and drink once, you know, a cup a day. But what I noticed with that medicine is it almost was flushing me out. And she had told me that she said, it's, it's cleaning, it's cleaning you out. She said, what a lot of women don't understand when you're going through menopause and the periods are excruciatingly heavy. She said, it's your body cleaning the toxins out of your system, getting you prepared to be a grandma. She said, it's getting you prepared to be a grandma and the negativity goes out with your period. It's a cleanse. She said, so when you're getting that, be grateful that your body's cleaning you out. She goes, I know it's hard. Like some people get it worse than others. She said, but try have that mindset that your body is cleaning itself. Your body's flushing now. It's getting it ready for this next phase of your life, right? And I'm like, yeah, easy for you to say. I'm like changing my pad. Every time I stand up, I'm inking. I'm like, this is retarded. <laughs> but she's like, well, it is what it is, right? She goes, but the medicine she made helped. You know, she said, I want you to start this every time you start your cycle. Even if you have two a month, I want you to start drinking this stuff, right? But that that's my story in a quick nutshell. You know, um, we're still kind of fighting to see if we can clean up the soil, uh, you know, but the environmental trauma is one thing I think that's severely overlooked in First Nations communities, like the health, the health effects, right? Because everybody assumes, okay, cancer. It's cancer. You know, that's the contamination. It's cancer. Well, not really. You know, there's a whole slew of other things that are happening to our people. And unfortunately, like if I didn't have clinicians that have I've been friends with for a long time, I wouldn't have investigated this further. And I probably would have been on antidepressants, mm -hmm. you know, just thinking it's it's trauma, you know, it's trauma. And I panic because I'm, you know, it's intergenerational trauma that's doing this. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, actually, no, like it's environmental trauma that did this to me. So, that, you know, that's a really good point that you're raising about the environment and, and how it impacts our health, especially as Indigenous women. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Oh, so much there to unpack. This is, uh, that like feels like a whole other a whole other series unto itself. Uh, I think just on on so many things that that she brought up, I I had I memories of things that I had wanted to talk about, and definitely more for another time. But um, talking about practitioners and her naturopath, I think that that was definitely the thing that really changed the game for me was finding a naturopath that I could really trust who worked with me to really identify where I was hormonally, because you go and get your panel chat panel done and you'll get one answer and that's it. But really you need to get your panel done several times during the month to understand where your hormones are and when, 
And so I started to do acupuncture and that I think has been my one most uh, important uh, modality of, of healing and managing the, the impact of perimenopause. So I definitely am uh, I'm on board with the naturopath and it, it can be very expensive, but I feel like I don't know what I would do without my, with my, without my naturopath and my acupuncture, my Chinese doctor, because I, that's the only way I feel relief really ever. Yeah, those are, I, I really enjoyed listening to the last caller because all of the symptoms that, um, that uh, she was listing off were just like, I, I was recalling that some of those symptoms I had and they went away for a while and then they come back again. And it, you think that you're, you think you're done with it and then it's not, uh, you know, and, and so it, it can be really challenging. I think uh, the environmental impacts and early onset menopause is, is something that we want to cover for sure in another another episode specifically early onset menopause and and all of the reasons around why that might happen for a person um april sini uh commented and asked and said that i could read this um so she says anin jen christy and tanya chimigwech for having this discussion because it helps a lot i think i may be experiencing perimenopause because my periods are not regular but can come every 30 to 38 days. In a sense, I have been feeling a bit of grief because I thought, felt as though my ability to give life was being taken away. I'm just glad that this conversation could be held. On the medicine perspective, my family has told me that rosehip tea is good for a woman, woman in menstruation. And thank you ladies for having this discussion. So Jen, before I queue up our next uh, our next guest, Brenda Rivers, I was wondering if you had some comments or thoughts about um, grief around the the end of your menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, so I think I have to go back to Jade's comment about sadness, but I think this this whole process has been about grieving. Um, someone else mentioned it, uh, like that there isn't a ceremony, you know, for this. Well, I guess that was Zoe. Um, I think it's, it, it, there is a lot of grief. There's not just grief around the end of, you know, being able to bear children or, uh, that just the, what that represents, but there's grief during this transition because it's not so much about bearing children as it is, you know, the, the end, it marks the end for us. And it's so emotional, right? Like when you said we spend 50 years in this, you know, phase and nobody talks about it. It was the first time I really thought like, yeah, there's a good, you know, there's a good chance that there could be 40, maybe 50 years left, but somehow this transition feels like how Zoe said, like it's the end. And what am I now? So there is grieving and absolutely April. Hi, by the way, April. Um, there is so much, so much grief around saying, you know, moving into a time where you're not, especially if you're, if you want to, to have children. I mean, I'm, I have people in my life who are racing against the clock and it's, it's a grief ridden process and it's very hard to watch, but I think that that's why ceremony is important. And if, if we, if we're able to continue the conversation of how do we, how do we create ceremony to bring us through this together to um, surrender to the, to the transition of this and where, where it leads us you know, as, as our previous speaker said, you know, preparing us to be grandmothers, um, and matriarchs, like to find the joy in this, because it's really full of a lot of things that feel like the opposite of joy and a lot of grieving. Thank you. Uh, Brenda Rivers, I have you unmuted. If you want to, um, want to unmute yourself, if you still had something that you wanted to say, um, if not, we can uh, move on to to somebody else. So, Brenda, are you still around? There we go. Yes, I am. 
um, a, a huge chimiguich for um, this this discussion because it's really I've learned so much already. I'm 61 and I went through menopause. It wasn't as bad as what I'm hearing. A lot of my friends went ahead of time and, and I learned from them. Um, one of the things they said dressed in layers. Um, so that wasn't too bad, but I had to have a hysterectomy. And I was really grateful I, I was able to go naturally. Um, and I was had learned somewhat of what was going on in my body. But with the hysterectomy, it's like round two of menopause. And it's pretty intense. What what I find uh, the most bothersome is the mood swings. Those are really intense. And another woman had mentioned about uh, facial hair. That's the other thing. I've got facial hair that drives me nuts. Um, there's only so much you can do and it hurts to wax, but it, it's almost like I'm getting a mustache. So I'm, I'm here to learn. I'm grateful for the opportunity. And if anybody has any advice on the facial hair, the mood swings, um, I'm just here to listen and learn. So Miigwech, thank you. I did want to just quickly speak to the to the mood swings and emotional state and just the general hormone imbalance issue that we're all facing. One of the things that I, I mean, I don't, I'm not perfect at it, but one of the things that I find really works is eating for hormone management. And, you know, you don't realize how much of our food is either has added hormones um, or is is harmful to you know to us in similar in a similar way to the environmental toxins and environmental trauma. So much of that is transferred into the food that we eat. And it's it changes, it definitely changes the way you eat or how much you can eat or where you can eat, but eating for for menopause and perimenopause and a balanced hormonal uh, kind of system, I think is a very good step. And also for me recently, it's been, I think 12 weeks since I've had alcohol. Um, I wouldn't say that I drank a lot of alcohol, but I definitely drank too much for someone going through perimenopause. And what I noticed was the alcohol was having a very negative impact on my hormonal balance and it was completely throwing me off track. I've taken alcohol out for 12 weeks and I probably reduced my symptoms by 20%. So this might be uh, the thing for me into the future. Thank you for that. Next up, we have Mary Jane Saizi. Are you there? I am going to um, put you on here. Just give me a second. All right, you can unmute yourself, Mary Jane. A uh, couple of couple... it, uh... <laughs> See, my Christian name is Mary Jane Sayazi, and my my spiritual name is Tenalter Sayazi, and I am from. I was born in Uranium City, and um, I'm, I grew up in Black Lake, Saskatchewan, and I'm a descendant from Camp 10, Churchill, Manitoba, the displacement of the Dene Sohine people. So my grandparents uh, my gr uh, followed the caribou herd to Stony Rapids on this, uh, on the orders of the priests. She used to tell me that story. And I'm so grateful that I can talk about my grandmother who traveled on the ice, the land, and traveled to uh, with the water and everything was clean. And when we talked about the menopause and all that, us Dene Sotine women who are from Northern Saskatchewan, they, I live in Coal Lake, Alberta right now. And I am, I'm reclaiming myself. And none of this, what you, we've talked about, what you ladies have talked about. I'm so honored to be sitting here with you ladies, first of all. And to talk about something like this is never within the Dene community up north. 
even with my mother, because she's a residential school prod, uh, survivor, and I am the product that they never tell the truth. So us Dene women from the northern Saskatchewan, I'll talk for myself, because I can't talk for everybody else, but how I grew up, I grew up amongst all the uranium pollution. But when I was with my grandmother, I grew up on the land, eating the caribou, the fish, eat, drinking the water straight out of the, the lake. And I moved away to learn, to go to school and to graduate and all that. And while I was, I left, I was called a Chippewan when I left. And then all of a sudden I became, I was like, no, I'm not a Chippewan, I'm Dene. And the food chain that I was eating was all changed. So the trauma that I was experiencing, I didn't even know what I was going through and all that. And that what my daughters, everybody is experiencing right now is the environmental trauma, like this other lady said here. Because us Dene Sohine women, the majority of the people up in northern Saskatchewan are dying of cancer right now. And when you talk about uranium, that's why you have cancer. You're not allowed to talk about that. You're not even allowed to talk about your periods. That's how I grew up. And it's so traumatizing to see that right now. And then what right now, what my mother went through and then now what we're going through. Right now, we're going through land theft. Like really, like that's trauma to me. Because nobody's looking after the water up there. And when I left my reserve and I came, I lived down here for like almost 40, 30 years now. And I became sick with diabetes because my food chain changed. And I was drinking lots and whatever. And I had to find my spirituality, my, my prayers and all that because I was Catholic. Everything I had to go through, the trauma and finding out what happened to my people, that was the biggest trauma. And I had nobody to talk to. And today I sit here with all this overwhelming, with all the pandemic we went through. I, and especially with the needles that my people got. It felt like another experiment going through my 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 DNA, my home. And now, right now, as we're speaking, you probably know about it. The uranium is like a gold rush up in northern Saskatchewan. Everybody from all over the world is going up there to take out the uranium. It's not supposed to be extracted. It's supposed to be left in there. So all our women there are sick, not allowed to talk about what really is menopause, your periods, nothing. And now, right now, the environmental trauma, the water, what's happening to our water, it's our medicine. Two years ago, when the pandemic happened, I'm 50, I'm going to be 55 in a couple of days. <laughs> and uh, I went through menopause, like I'm going through menopause. I have three children. I, I had a stillbirth. And during my menopause, like pre-menopause, and now my menopause last year, two years ago, when this pandemic, everybody got shut down, everything, there was no food on the shelf. I had to return to the land. I was like 300 pounds diabetic. I couldn't even walk or anything. And I'm going through this trauma, this emotional, I didn't know what was happening to me because I didn't have anybody to talk to because I speak Dene is my first language. And then I, I, there was no food on the shelf. And then I remembered what my grandmother told me that one day, you'll have to return back to the land because the food, the white people are 
offering you, you're going to get sick from everything. So I went back to my, to the, to the, the country food, the meat, the moose meat, the deer, whatever I could find somebody, I had to get somebody to kill for me to hunt. And then I had to get fish. And then summertime came, I had to go and got berries, everything I had to get from the land, how I grew up. And now today, I in 2021, when this started, I was 288 pounds, 80 pounds or something. Today, last week, when I weighed myself, at the doctor's office, I was 188 pounds. Oh. That, and then, but all my people are dying. My aunties, my both of my aunties are dying of cancer. My dad's dying of cancer. His cabin is behind that uranium ca camp. And they don't want to talk about it because the... The companies told our people, the church, all of them, they're all involved. They were told this is the Jesus or the God's medicine or disease. So you're dying from that, they're saying. Yeah, so yeah. they're still lying to our people. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know, I just wanted to tell you guys that because that's what our young women and women like me are going through in Northern Saskatchewan mm. and trapped by man camps controlled by them. And we're still being not heard. And through this way, maybe we can speak and learn through so we can help each other like that. So our daughters and our mothers don't suffer and go back on the land because that's where our medicine is. Water is our medicine. That's what I use. I so, appreciate your comments so much. Thank you so much, Brenda. The, uh, what you, everything, I, hmm? Yeah, everything you said was so important. And uh, I, we really appreciate yeah. your appreciate your comments. Yes. I think, uh, yeah, having a having a session on environmental racism, environmental uh, trauma, environmental impacts on our lands and waters, how that connects to us, uh, our bodies, how it connects to our menopause uh, transition, our menopause experiences, is so important. And uh, you really touched on so many points. It was really a pleasure having you as a as our last speaker for the day. So thank you so much, Brenda. I just want to read a couple of um, things that that people had said, and then we'll, we'll, Tanya and I are going to come back on screen for a second. Um, so Lorraine wrote, uh, we won't get into this question at all, but I'll just say that the answer to this question will come on April 19th or 20th when Dr. Janet Smiley is going to be one of our guests. She says, I have a couple questions regarding having pain and dryness uh, during intercourse. Uh, it, I used to love having relationships and now I don't want to be touched. So I think that that's something that so many people can identify with. Um, and and uh, Dr. Janet Smiley has some um, uh, sort of discussions that we've had about this kind of thing um, going into our next session with her in April. And also I have, it, it sort of leads into the next question, which is, are there any books, good book recommendations on menopause? Um, that's by Charlotte Cardinal. Um, and I'll turn that over to Jen, but just before I do, uh, I can say that I was just reading the menopause manifesto and i went got through that book uh, by dr jen gunter and um in that book she specifically talks about uh, sexual relationships and changes to uh, vaginal areas and and what happens and things that you can do to uh, to help in that area because there is help so i just thought that i would just mention the menopause manifesto and then i'm going to turn it over to Jen and Tanya and I will come back on. I also read the 
uh, menopause manifesto. And, you know, I didn't, it wasn't as interesting as I thought it would be, but there were some very helpful things. And I think at the time it was the sex part that I was very interested in because that's a big one for sure. But I have this, I don't know when I bought it. And this is like prevention magazine. <laughs> um, it was like the, one of the greatest little magazines of that I have read. It just has all kinds of, all kinds of little hacks in here. Um, hormone handbook. That's all it says. Prevention.com hormone handbook. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess in terms of like, I love following all of the hormone stuff on TikTok. Um, I just find that that's a great community to be a part of, um, just to not feel so alone all the time. And, you know, uh, I guess I, I also don't want to be the, be the person in my relationship always talking about menopause because you know my husband's life is important too just not as important as my menopause <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, I agree more spaces to talk about things more more resources more people more just more time more more support more ceremony um Zoe and I who spoke we we're going to work on something uh on a dramatic level so yeah this this conversation is exploding. And I think we have, we really have those of us who can be vulnerable and talk about how uncomfortable sex is or, you know, our own sexuality and, and how it disappears, like out of just, it just goes away. <laughs> it's just like, Deet. and then how to get that back. Like all of those things, I will talk about it as much as possible because I know how hard that is to talk about. And, uh, if anything, we should be able to at least hold on to that, to that feeling. So that's a whole other episode. Well, thanks so much, Jen. Oh, sorry, Christy, I can see you. you're on mute. My mouth was moving, <laughs> but there was no sound coming out. <laughs> Looks like it was really important. <laughs> I, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> Most likely not. But um, so I, I think for myself, like listening to everybody's stories and listening to their questions and comments and, and their symptoms also sort of like there was some people who mentioned some symptoms where I was thinking, Oh, shoot, I never even associated that with menopause. And one of the things that I would think that would be useful for people is to go to the dentist and see if you have any bone loss and if you have bone loss, and then maybe that will lead into um, getting an osteo, a, a bone density test um, so that you have at least a baseline to know where your bone density is or where you're um, if you're at risk for osteoporosis, one thing I wish we started this conversation by saying, what, what would I wish that I had known um, younger? I wish that I had known that muscle loss was a part of aging, but it's also a part that's uh, exacerbated by, um, by menopause and the transition. So it, if I had have known that now would I have listened? I don't know. But if I had have known that, you know, the idea of doing weight bearing exercises or something along those lines to make sure that I was in, not in a position to lose more muscle um, rather than run and do cardio and do all those kinds of things. Uh, maybe I would have focused more on weight bearing exercises for mobility and strength into the future, into what will hopefully be my old age. Um, the other thing that I that I really appreciate is hearing people from uh, their own territories in their own experiences within their nation, um, like our last caller and and our first two episodes, I felt really empowered by the idea that that as women, uh, as people who are going through menopause, we're coming into our power, we're entering a new stage of life. What does that mean? It was never a negative thing. In, in not in my nation anyway, it was never considered negative until you know that period of sort of negativity happened with our with our people. But it was wasn't considered negative before that. You know, we we would have seen people uh, who enter the grandmother. I use that loosely stage um, being our grandparent. Uh, age, uh, being a powerful person, somebody who has come through a lot, uh, come through a lot, and has a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom that they've accumulated, who now has 
more knowledge about bodies, more knowledge about their own experience that they can share with with other people in younger generations. So I feel like menopause is a ceremony. Um, this is my sort of my theory right now that I'm coming to. I'm coming to this understanding that perhaps I don't need a ceremony conducted by somebody else because this transition is my ceremony. And I'm starting to see it like that and feel good about it rather than feel negative. And that's what this these series have done for me so far is really lifted me up to feel much better about what's going on and not so alone. So with that, I'll turn it over to to Tan. I think um, what comes to mind about menopause and, and our role in our communities is um, what I learned recently about the killer whales. They're, I think, one of the only other mammals who go through menopause. And in fact, once the killer whale does go through menopause, they have an elevated stature in their community. And they're one of the more important and powerful figures in their pods. And I, 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 that really resonated with me a lot. And I don't know if that's just wishful thinking on my part, but I really think that it is, you know, talking about bringing back the matriarch and what is the matriarchy? I, I think it is that it is menopause and those changes and in moving into that phase of our life because it can very well be the whole half second half of our life 40 to 50 years so i i really like what christy says about the menopause being in and of itself the ceremony and so what can we do how do we support each other as we're going through our individual ceremonies? So community becomes something very important. And it's one of the things that we will be talking about in the first week of May with Lana Whiskey Jack about how to organize or the experience of organizing women in your community so you can have those conversations and build spaces for yourself to go through your ceremony. Because Christy and I will do this as long as we can, but eventually, or soon, sooner than later, you can have your own groups of women where you are and have those conversations and discuss things that are unique to where you are, such as the environment around you or your particular language or you know common experiences will emerge and and in that you you'll create something very powerful um a community of women in ceremony that that sounds pretty pretty powerful and amazing to me so i i just want to thank you again jen for for coming on today and apologize to everyone who we didn't get a chance to get to your question or to your comment and remind you that we have a Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, you can go in there and post your questions. That's a little bit of a community forum for you if you want. Um, people can respond to you if you had something you wanted to ask but didn't have a chance. Maybe someone will see it and have an answer to it for you there. So just encourage you to check out our Facebook page. Do you have any final comments, Jen? Oh, there's just so much more to talk about. And I'm looking forward to all the conversations that you're having on this program and also the continued conversations that we're all going to have. And I love that idea, Christy, about the Sarah, that this is a ceremony and just, just hearing that makes me think about, you know, moving forward a little bit differently. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And to, to, Fewer sleepless nights to all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, insomnia is insomnia as well. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we, we're going to stop the recording now, and and this is the end of the session. We understand Jen has to run, so thank you once again, Jen, and thanks, Ten, thank and, we'll, you so and thanks, much. Nicole, thanks, Nicole, our admin. <laughs> okay.